Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I want to highlight something that our Patreon supporters have done that will change our video theater. Patreon supporters crossed the $800 threshold. As a result of that, we did an upgrade and moved all of our video theater to an outside host. What that means is videos will not slow down your old-time radio listening enjoyment. And in addition to that, while we had been limiting the number of video theaters that we had uh, available, thanks to our Patreon supporters, all past recordings that we did with the hosted uh, videos are now up and will continue to be available. And you can follow the video podcast with public domain television programs and movies at videotheater.greatdetectives.net. And if you want to support the program, you can do so either on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net or become one of our Patreon supporters, patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of Nightbeat. I should mention that Nightbeat is entering kind of a dead zone where lost episodes really mean we don't have very many episodes from this era. Between the 50th and 92nd episodes of Nightbeat, we have a grand total of four episodes that are available, so more than 90% missing. This one aired only five weeks after the previous one. The original air date on it is August the 17th of 1951. And the title is They. NBC presents Frank Lovejoy in Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Only tonight it was too hot to cover anything, and I mean anything. It was too hot for wife killings, gangland murders, and such nonsense. Nobody had energy for much more than to wave a soggy newspaper back and forth in front of his face. And the standard reply to the standard question, what's cooking, was a dull me. Around 10 o'clock, with no story in sight, I checked in with the office, and the switchbird girl sounded like the last rose of last summer, but she managed to inform me that Mr. Baker, the night editor, wanted words with me. As she wearily connected me, I dug out my handkerchief and blotted the back of my neck. Stone? Yeah? Climb in your old jalopy and take her right out to the insane asylum. Have they got air conditioning? No, I'm serious. There's a report that a half a dozen police cars are parked near the entrance. I called the check, but the switchboard doesn't answer. Meet it out there, Randy. I headed for the outskirts of town, and soon I was approaching my destination. I guess the way the world's been spinning around, a lot of people are getting lost in the fog because this place was really big. Half a dozen huge buildings spread out across acres of green land and a mighty high fence running all the way around. But even while I was still blocks away, I knew something was wrong. Because though it was only around ten o'clock, in all those buildings there wasn't one light burning. I drove up to the gate, and yep, there were police cars, and the police sergeant with a red flashlight signaled me to a stop. What's your business, cousin? Uh, I'm a newspaper man, Randy Stone of the Star. They're not buying any newspapers tonight. Got all the newspapers they need. Oh, fine. Now you and your flashlight step aside, and I'll go on in. No one goes in, no one goes out. Orders, cousin. Now you get on that gate phone, cousin, and tell the superintendent the press is pounding at the walls. And if I don't get in, I'm going back to town and invent a story. When I start inventing, sometimes I just never stop. Well, I Go ahead, think... cousin. When the Sarge hung up the phone, he swung open the gates and waved me in with his pretty red flashlight, saying that I was to go right on to the administration building. 
As I drove up the curved roadway, I saw little shafts of light moving through the darkness all over the place, but still no lights anyplace else. I parked in front of the administration building and was met by a man also carrying a flashlight. That man, this is my name, the public relations officer. Oh, uh, what's going on here? It's rather embarrassing, you know. I'm quite sure they'll find him any minute now. Find who? Uh, the superintendent thinks it would be best if you talk to Fogarty. Oh. This way, please. Mm-hmm. Right in here. The first aid room. Hey, easy, Doc. Mm-hmm. Easy, easy with the head. Uh, this chap, uh, having his head bandaged. Fogarty, this is Mr. Stone, a newspaper reporter. But I thought... Uh... Well, the superintendent feels it's pointless to try and hide the facts any longer. Oh. They caught Captain Bob yet? They expect to any moment. I take it one of the inmates has escaped. Oh, no, no, not really. He's still on the grounds. That's what we don't want. No alarming story about an escaped maniac. Maniac, yeah. Hey, Doc, Doc, easy with a bandage. Hard to work with just a flashlight. Yeah. Captain Bob, that kills me, absolutely kills me. He's the unofficial mayor of this place, a real veteran. <laughs> Once he even applied for hash marks of service stars. And then to blow his top like this. Hey, easy, Doc, will you? Almost finished. I don't know. A huge man with a mind of a child. A gentle giant, you might say. <laughs> gentle. Uh, what caused the blow-up? What caused it? Yeah. That's a reasonable question. We took away his brown sugar. His, uh, his which? He kept it in his footlocker for his oatmeal. Well, they were afraid of roaches, you know, so they kept asking him to turn it in. And today they got tired of him ignoring them. So they sent me around for it. It was all by himself in a ward, this giant of a man. Sitting on his bed in his gym shoes and his red bathrobe. Captain Bob. Captain Bob. Splendid, that was splendid. Wasn't that splendid, Fogarty? Yeah, sure. Now listen. You, you know, it's all in the diaphragm. It's right down here, the diaphragm, you see. Yeah, how many times did I tell him? Enrico, if you only breathe properly and forgot the chicken. Open country, your foot Fogarty. locker, Captain. And why? The brown sugar. It's gotta go. Okay. Sweet okay, I'll open it myself. Hold it. Uh, down goes the lid. Now, goodbye, Mr. Fogarty. Look, I got my orders. Roger Stop that racket, will you? They gave me orders to take that sugar. Repeat that slowly, Mr. Fogarty. I said they gave me orders. They gave you orders. They again. They know that brown sugar is the very essence of my power, so they must take it away from me. Now, come on, Captain Bob. How long ago was it that they decided I could no longer have my fine gold leaf tobacco plug? And wasn't it only last year that they made me shave my beard? Walt used to say to me, Walt Whitman, that is, Sure, mine's a decent sort of beard, but yours, Captain Bob, why, yours is pure silk. And they made me shave it. Cap, you're getting all excited. It's too hot to get excited. Oh, I've sat back. I've bided my time. I've waited. And now I wait no longer. Cap, Hands relax. off of me, Fogarty. Cap, sit down. No, no. But don't make me use the nightstick. I never used it no. yet. I never want to. Yeah, but I want to. Now give it to me. Now look out. Get away from me. The nightstick. No. You must. You must. You must. Ah. Their hour is struck. Their hour is struck. Their hour has struck. Their hour has struck. That's the last thing in the world I heard. Then I woke up down here. I understand he's really raised Kane, broke into the power station, banged up the generator. <laughs> Captain Bob. You just don't figure. Well, I, I don't suppose that one guy with a nightstick is going to do too much damage. Uh, well, it's not quite that simple. No? He took the nightstick and overpowered an armed guard. And now he has a gun. Oh, fine. 
And that's why we've gone to such great lengths to protect the place. Uh, I'll answer it. Uh, this, uh, this they that he Get speaks up. of, he uh, must mean the authorities here, is that it? Oh, I don't think so. At least he hasn't tried to harm any of them. And with that gun, he could do a pretty good job. Well, then who is the, uh, the they? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. I see. That was one of the guards. The superintendent saw your car and raised the roof. Well, he told me I could come in. Yes, but not the car. He wants nothing on the grounds that could possibly be used by Captain Bob for an escape. He wants you to remove the car immediately. You can park it in the parking area outside the wall. I went on out and started driving back down the road to the gate. The little groups with flashlights were still scattered all about hunting for Captain Bob. But who was Captain Bob hunting for? My friend, the police sergeant, was still at the gate with his little red flashlight, again signaling me to stop. You again, cousin? I'm just going to park the car. Be right back. What's that supposed to be? Good news? Well, go on. I passed the squad car scattered all over the place. The parking area was just ahead, and I started turning into it. I suddenly felt a metallic pressure on my neck, the barrel of a gun. Just keep going down the highway, my boy. And everything will be Jim Dandy. I could see him in the rear view mirror. Bright eyes under shaggy gray brows, a bald head and a full pink face, and even bigger than they had described him. Yes, I had myself a first-class passenger. The one and only Captain Bob. No, isn't it a mortal sin the way old Captain Bob twisted him all around his little finger? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, mental power. You know, ten ounces of brain tissue can move mountains, dry oceans, fill the sky with fire. Yeah, ten ounces, sure, but uh, me, I'm stuck with about half a gram falling for a gag like that. Uh, Where'd you call from? One of the other offices, keeping my voice very low, very official. The superintendent insists that the car be moved at once. (laughs) Ellen used to... I used to say to Ellen, you know, the, the, the famous actress, Ellen Drew, you know. Uh-huh. Ellen, you must always remember, live the part. If you're supposed to be an oyster stew, then become an oyster stew. Make it so real, the people get heartburn. <laughs> Captain Bob, she would reply in that sweet, gentle voice, what would I do without you? Well, that's very interesting, uh... Now that you've outsmarted all the guards, uh, what's the next step? Uh, To ruthlessly hunt down and exterminate humanity's greatest enemy. Which is who? Well, they. They? Well, who else? Those scavengers, those ravagers. I I really don't care about myself. I've lived my years. I'm an old man. Uh, Heavy with honor and with time. Aristophanes. Uh huh. Of course, you know I'm quite insane. Uh, no. Oh yes, yes. So it doesn't matter about me. It's the others. Oh, what they have done to poor suffering humanity. I've heard the talk. Oh yes, surely I have. You know, of course, I can hear quite distinctly for a distance of some twenty three hundred miles. Really? Oh, certainly, with the the proper atmospheric conditions. Ah. And very often, late at night, I lie there in my bed listening to the people talking in, the, oh, San Francisco and Houston and Memphis and uh, Upper New York State and such places. Uh-huh. And what do I hear? They are causing prices to rise sky high. They buy more than they need. They hoard in their basements. They patronize the black market. They are so selfish, so thoughtless, they may bring on inflation and wipe out the savings and pensions of millions of innocent people. That's what I hear. I see. And this I hear. They certainly elect some shabby politicians. But what can you expect? Most of the time, they don't even bother to vote. If they don't use some judgment, they'll wreck the country. They again, you see that? Uh, yes, I see it. Yes, and I hear talk about war, too. They fell asleep again. If they don't wake up and prepare, civilization itself will go under, and they'll be to blame. They, 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 they do this and they do that. All the evil and suffering in the world, they are responsible for. They. Well... 
Then isn't it all rather simple? Old Captain Bob's going to do the world one final service. He's going to find these they and shoot them down like dogs. That sounds like a reasonable idea. Yes, of course. Of course. I, uh, saw your sign on your license plate. You're a newspaper man. Huh? Uh-huh. Well, then you must know where they live. You'll be able to bring me to them, huh? Well, I, I suppose so, but it might take a long time, Ken. Oh, you better not take any longer than from now till 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Why? Well, I have to be back at the asylum by then for... for breakfast. I see. Mrs. Turner, the cook, she takes great pains preparing the oatmeal to my complete satisfaction. Oh, well, in that case... Why are you turning the car around? Well, if that's all the time we got, let's call it off for tonight and get a, an early start tomorrow evening, say, uh, around six. I see. Now you've decided to trick Captain Bob. No, no, not at all, but if you're expected for breakfast... Pull over to the curb. I'm not trying to trick at you. At the present angle of my gun, the bullet should enter your skull at the basal juncture. You will lose consciousness within one second, be dead within three. Uh, okay. Uh, you talked me into it. All right, now turn off the engine. Yep. Oh, it was a mistake to tell you I was insane. Now you think I'm a harmless old fool, don't well, not you? Not at all. Oh, no, of course you do, but I'm not harmless, sir. I need your help, so I suppose I must convince you that I'll not hesitate to use this gun if you force me. I believe you. Oh, no, of course you don't. A strange weapon, is it not? A chunk of ore twisted into a vulgar shape, yet it's made man supreme. Oh, now, come on, put down the gun, Captain. Shooting me won't help you. Who said anything about you, my boy? Observe... Pointing it at your hand. Don't! <coughs> well, you've torn away half your finger. <coughs> That's all right. I have others. Let me use this handkerchief as a tourniquet. <coughs> no trickery. No now. trickery. Now, come on. Here. <coughs> okay. Now, I've got to pull it tight. <coughs> all right. All right, now. That's better. What a thing to do. Now, you understand how serious I am about this. Yeah. Obviously, if I can use the gun on myself, I wouldn't hesitate to use the gun on you. If I felt you were trying to fool me. Obviously. So take me into the city. And let's hunt the rascals down. Yeah. One thing more, sir. Yeah? There can be trickery by omission. If you think you can drive me around in meaningless circles, well, let me hasten to assure you that if we haven't found them by breakfast, well, then I know you fool me. And I will kill you. NBC is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Tonight your dial is set for adventure with Inspector Thorne and Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. This evening, actor Carl Weber comes to the NBC microphone as the fast-moving police investigator known as Inspector Thorne. Then later, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, brings you the hard-hitting story of the poison sandwich murder case. Now back to Nightbeat and Randy Stone. It was after one o'clock and I was driving through the Chicago streets, block after deserted block. The neon that never went to sleep, still shouting its multicolored messages to empty sidewalks. And past long rows of warehouses, wearily leaning one against the other, and through narrow cobblestone streets. Driving purposefully like I had nothing but jumbo-sized plans, while actually I didn't even have a small pocket-sized idea. And Captain Bob in the back seat with his gun growing more impatient all the time. And now it was almost 2 a.m. And in my mind's eye, I saw the good cook, what's-her-name, sleeping soundly 
and just a few hours away from starting the captain's oatmeal. And now we were getting close to the loop. I turned off Ashland Avenue to cross the bridge spanning the Chicago River. And at the other side of the bridge, I saw a most wonderful sight. Two police cars blocking the way, their red warning lights blinking angrily. Turn around quickly, my boy. And suddenly in the rear view mirror, I saw still another police car swing in behind us. We were caught on the bridge, trapped like a butterfly on a half dozen spears of light. Well, now what, Captain Bob? I'm turning the matter over in my mind. That you, Strong? Right. All right. Close in slowly, men. Mr. Stone. Tell them how comfortable this gun feels against your head. Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant, take it easy. Captain Bob has sort of got me covered. Captain Bob, can you hear me? (laughs) Can I hear him? I've heard Brisbane, Australia on a very calm night. Can I hear him? You hear me, Captain Bob. He hears you, but he's not impressed. Cap, what do you want them to do? Clear off the bridge so we can get on with our chore. It's getting late. Look, Cap, I'm going to be frank with you. And if you want to pull the trigger, well, my insurance is paid up. Well, what is it, my boy? I don't have any idea where they may be. Ah. Oh, it's true. But you take the lieutenant now, it's his job to know those things. I bet he could tell us where they are just like that. All right. Call him over and ask him. No, no, no. We can't do it that way. If he knows that you want to find out about they just to kill them, why, he'll never tell us. Well, why not, for goodness sake? Well, he just won't. He's a funny guy. So? Well, so let me go over and talk to him. You know, con him around, wheedle it out of him. You you think you can, my boy? Yes, I think so. I've I've known him for many years. He's not very bright. Oh, I, I could tell that from his voice. He does all this talking from his jowls. So I'll go over and ask him, huh? You, uh... You wouldn't be fooling an old man with a sore finger. Scout's on her, Captain. All right, call that young policeman over there, the one that's leaning on the fender of the squat car. Oh, him? Oh, Oh, him. He's an old cousin of mine. Yeah, call him over if you want to talk to the lieutenant. All right. Hey, Sarge. Me? Yeah, come on over. Are you nuts or something? Send him over, lieutenant. Sergeant, go on. Cousin, the minute I saw you tonight, I knew I'd have been better off with typhoid. Uh, both of us. Now, I tell you what I'd like for you to do, young man. You... Just lean your head in through the window. What is this? Do what he says. I've got to go talk to the lieutenant. Now we take the gun from Mr. Stone's head and place it against yours. Hey. All right, Mr. Stone, go to your conference. The dashboard clock says seven minutes after two. If you've not returned by ten minutes after two, this unfortunate young man will meet with sudden disaster. Stone, I don't like this. Uh, No one could blame you, cousin. I started walking across the bridge to the lieutenant's patrol car. A long string of coal barges was slithering slowly by on the breezy waters far below. Now, whatever unknown radar wakens people out of a sound sleep and sends them running to disaster was already at work. Both ends of the bridge were lined with the curious, and most of the police officers were busy keeping them at a distance. Lieutenant Boyle stood beside his squad car. Uh, Lieutenant, tell me, how did you find out that he was with me? The sergeant, oh? after you left to park your car and didn't come back, he started wondering. Checked and found it had been a phony call. It added up. We've been trying to corner you all night. What are you going to do with that character? Well, we've got one problem, and it's how to make him... Use up those bullets in his gun. Yeah. But now, look, I got a crazy thought. It might work. If it doesn't, well, it's my funeral. And as the little joke goes, that's not a figure of speech. All right. What is it? Uh, You know where the river view is? Yeah, that amusement park on the west side? Yeah. What are we going to do? Ride the merry-go-round? Everything is closed up this time of the night, but see if you can get them to cooperate with you. Captain Bob is looking for something he calls they. Don't ask me to go into that. There's no time. But if we work this... Well, 
welcome back, my boy. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I was telling this lad here that those barges reminded me of my river days on the Mississippi. He seemed distinctly uninterested. I can't imagine why. All right, now point the gun at him. Yeah, right in the old basal junction. Uh, uh, that's that's it. Cousin, I was really sweating you out. Uh, believe me, I was tempted to start walking. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, goodbye now. Did you get the information, my boy? Well, you know something? Uh, you ought to circle this date with a red pencil cap. What? This is your lucky night. Oh? They are all together under one roof. What? Having a meeting. Oh, Doubtlessly plotting some new devil. Sure, but I know exactly where they are. Oh, this is grand news. Well, the police are leaving. Well, sure. I, I told them you were going to go back to the institution like a good, solid citizen. And so I shall, when I'm finished. But now, to the task ahead. Yeah, to the, uh, to the task ahead. It was 2.45 a.m. when we pulled up before the darkened amusement park. The Ferris wheels silhouetted against the dark sky and the empty seats creaking just a little as though worn out from generations of screaming children. The towering wooden structure of the Super Bobs, dipping and rising gracefully in the night. And the fun house and the merry-go-round and the tunnel of love all sealed up. A wilderness of potential joy, but now very quiet and painfully lonely. An amusement park where no one was being amused. We walked down the boardwalk, Captain Bob, gun in hand, and Randy Stone, heart in mouth. A strange place for they to be meeting, my boy. Well, wouldn't they pick such a place knowing that no one would ever think of looking for them here? Well, well, of course. (laughs) Oh, the treachery of them. It's just ahead now. That little building there. Yes, yes. Oh, the dream of a lifetime reaching fruition. It's all boarded up, but you can see the lights gleaming through the cracks. Yes, yes. Now, here is what you've got to remember, Cap. Huh? There'll be many, many of them. They're all armed and they're on guard. I do not fear. No, no, but you want to get as many as you can. Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, now keep your voice down. Now... You've got to start shooting the instant you go through that door and keep shooting as fast as you can. Yes. That is, if you can shoot fast. Well, trust me, you will not be able to separate the sound of the shots. All right. Good luck. Uh, my boy, thank you. Will you shake my hand? Of course. You've been a loyal ally. The time will come when children will sing folk songs in your honor. Your statue will stand in public parks. Yeah. Now, look, I'm going to tear open the door and you rush in and start shooting. Yes, yes. Ready, set, go. After that, things happened rapidly. The park, which had seemed so empty now, suddenly filled with police all running toward me. And behind them came the swarms of citizens again, coming in all directions, attracted by the shots. Good work, Stone. Get the door open, boys. Bring them out. Through the open door, I looked in on the House of Mirrors. Most of the mirrors were shattered now, just bits of glass hanging from the walls. And Captain Bob, the empty gun, hanging limply in his hand, still looking at the wreckage, dazedly realizing at last that he'd been shooting at his own reflections. Come on, old-timer, let's get going. Easy with him, boy. Yep. That's it, easy. And now the entrance to the House of Mirrors was jammed with people craning their necks for a look. Step aside, give us room, come on. Move aside, folks, it's all over. Go on home. Come on now, one side. And while the police tried to clear a path through the crowd, for a moment or so, Captain Bob and I stood face to face. So you tricked me after all, my boy. It's a cruel blow. Captain Bob didn't expect that of you. Come on, all of you. Move when I tell you. One side. Okay, Cap. Let's go. You tricked me. 
You shouldn't have done that to me, my boy. You just don't understand. And then he was gone. He was back home in plenty of time for his oatmeal without brown sugar. But even after they took old Captain Bob away, somehow the people still hung around the doorway of the House of Mirrors just in case there might be something else to see. Their faces reflected endlessly in the broken mirrors. All kinds of faces. Fat, lean, bright, dull, high and cheekbones, low cheekbones, square chins, no chins, white faces, black faces, endless faces. Millions of faces reflected again and again and again in the mirrors. And gradually it dawned on me that perhaps I hadn't tricked Captain Bob after all. I guess I had brought him to the right place. Because, of course, there's no big mystery about it. These were the they, all right. That's us, all of us. But if they are responsible for the bad, they are also responsible for the good. Actually, when you got right down to it, to end all the injustices that so angered Captain Bob, they need learn only one thing more, that they are the children of God, and that each of them is his brother's keeper. Oh, what a night. Uh, uh, one copy boy, one ice bag, and two aspirins, huh? Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's story was written by Larry Marcus with music by Robert Armbruster. The part of Cap was played by Bill Conrad. Others in tonight's cast were Paul Dubuff, Howard McNear, Frank Gersel, and Jeff Corey. Frank Lovejoy can currently be seen starring in Warner Brothers' Force of Arms. Listen next week at this time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. There's plenty of fun in store for you tomorrow night with Inside Bob and Ray. Bob Elliott and Ray Goulding, the newest comedy team in radio, bring you the light satire and nonsense sketches designed to display their many vocal impressions and impersonations. Here Inside Bob and Ray, Saturday evening, for one full fun-filled hour on NBC. Join Inspector Thorne next on NBC. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. A tremendous performance from William Conrad. And really, outside of Gunsmoke, I don't think any old-time radio series gave him a better chance to show what he could do as an actor. And it reflects the power of radio. Because uh, the reason you don't see these sort of really rich roles uh, for uh, Bill Conrad in many of the other media is he didn't uh, physically fit uh, a lot of the types that uh, television and film really came to rely on. On radio, he could perform in any role that he could be convincing in. And we're seeing in Nightbeat that there was such a great variety of roles. And I like how he's able to make so many of these characters very uh, different. Now, there are some of the characters he played that are more... Oh, the typical hoods and heavies that he played on other series. Uh, there are so many great, memorable roles that uh, he portrayed. So many uh, fantastic emotional moments. And uh, this episode, I think, was just another example. Clearly different from the other characters he's played on the series. With a lot of uh, thought into creating this character. And it says a lot about an actor's uh, work ethic as well as the strength of the script. As you come in, you're going to hear in a radio show for 
half an hour and a guest part, not going to be paid a ton of money. And probably the episode, as far as you know, is never going to be listened to again. And Conrad in Nightbeat just went out there time and time again and created these unforgettable characters. I also did like the closing line of this episode. I should say of Randy's column. The, epi- the closing line of the episode was funny. But the line of the column, it really could be uh, Randy Stone's Credo. It's the theme of his life and uh, and the series as a whole. So a very solid uh, episode. And again, this makes me uh, really wish we had more episodes from this period in the series. But we'll take what we have and uh, look forward to next week and another episode of Nightbeat. Coming up tomorrow, though, Pursuit. In the meantime, uh, do send your comments at box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And check out our YouTube archive, youtube.greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.